Lord, as we just sang, how great you are. Oh, I pray that you would overwhelm us with the reality of that. that God, that we would have a clear picture of you and our responsibility to even to boast and proclaim your glory and God, to declare your goodness and your magnificence and your greatness to the world around us, to declare that you and you alone are God. And I ask you, God, as, you, as we come to your word now, please let your spirit actively be moving among us. I pray that you would help me to speak clearly and truthfully to what we're looking at today. And I pray for all of us, God, that our hearts would be open to learning from you exactly what it is you want to teach us from your glorious word today. Truly, how great you are. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> a, a mom and her children were watching a, a PBS special. It was showing the birth of, of a newborn. And one of the children was fascinated by this, and they said, Mom, d does that hurt? <laughs> and she's like, it most certainly does, as she vividly remembers the past pain, all that she went through. And this child was so intrigued by what they'd just seen. and said, wow, does it hurt the mother too? Right? So it all depends on your perspective, right? Fortunately, none of us remember what that was like, but if you look at it, Wow, that couldn't have been pleasant for that child. And for those of you who have given birth, well, I commend you all, and uh, I'm glad it's you and not me, but it's one of those things that it depends on perspective, doesn't it? I tell Tammy all the time, you, you can ask her, I'm always telling her how, how thankful that I am to God, that I am the man and she is the woman. Because let's be honest, uh, ladies, I'm just going to say it, you guys have it so much tougher than us men do in so many different ways. Now, now, maybe not the least of which is the fact that you have to put up with us men, but still the reality is I do think women, whew, you, guys, you guys have it tough. But again, perspective, deal, perspective affects everything in regards to this. And speaking of perspective, I think that what, as we continue our journey here, our study of 2 Corinthians, we can see today that Paul is trying to bring the church in Corinth around to a godly perspective. He wants them to understand what truth really is. And last week we talked about this. We introduced that when we began chapter 10, we really entered into the third and the final section of this book. And then that goes from chapters 10 all the way through the end in verse th or chapter 13. But this last section, it focuses primarily <clears throat> on Paul's defense against the false teachers. It's been a theme that's been part of the book of his defense, but now in this, these final four chapters, it specifically targets his defense against the false teachers that had invaded, uh, infiltrated the church there in Corinth. And as we talked about again last week, Paul's defense is an aggressive offense. He takes the issue to them now. He goes on the attack against these people. And because Paul realizes that this is not just a physical battle that he is engaged in, he understands very well, and we talked again about this last week, it is a spiritual battle that he is engaged in. It's a spiritual battle for truth. And that is also something you and I are involved in every single day of our lives. Spiritual battle for the truth of the Word of God. Now, in our text today, Paul deals with the subject of boasting. And that's not really anything new to us, not in this study here, because we saw it several months ago when we began um, this book, in fact, back in chapter 1. I want you to turn, we'll be right back to chapter 10 here, <clears throat> but let's just go back and look at something we talked about at length when we were going through this. Chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, I want to just read verses 12 through 14 and have you follow along as I do that. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 <laughs> Beginning in verse 12, Paul wrote this. He said, for our boast, there's the word, okay? For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand 
just as you did partially understand us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we will boast of you. And when we were going through that, we, we talked about this, and just to remind you, of it, boasting is something that Paul uses more times in the book of 2 Corinthians. That word, he uses it more times in this book than he does in all other 12 books combined of the New Testament that he wrote. 32 times in this book here, 2 Corinthians, he uses some form of the word boast, whereas in the other 12 all together, he uses it 27 times. So it is a common theme in 2 Corinthians. And, and again, as we saw when we were in chapter 1 going through that, we, we will see again this morning, I want to remind you of the truth. In fact, this is going to be our theme for today. It is that boasting about God and His work in our lives is the only proper reason to boast. It should never be about ourselves or our own accomplishments. And I'm reminded of huh, that powerful verse in Psalm 115, verse 1. I put it on the screen so you can just see it there before you. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Boasting is never to be about ourselves. If it is, then we know that we're doing something wrong. When we hear someone boasting about their achievements, we know that they are not boasting in the proper way. Because boasting always needs to be about God and His work in our lives. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And in fact, what Paul does with this, now I want back in 2 Corinthians 10, I want to just look at our verses here for today, our text. And in this, Paul, he really, there's two main points that we have for this in this section. First of all, is this that Paul's authority as an apostle was God-given, not self-proclaimed. And that's in verses 7 through 12. And I want you just to look at the very first sentence with me in, in verse 7. Look at what is before your eyes. That can be translated in one of two ways. It can be translated either as an indicative, not to get lost in the English stuff, but the words, but an indicative, what that means is it's simply stating the way things are. In fact, that's how the NIV translates it. The NIV says, you are judging by appearances. They translated the, the phrase that Paul uses here as saying, this is what you're doing, an indicative, just stating the truth. But it can also be translated as an, an imperative. An imperative is a command. And that's how the ESV translates it. Notice that. It's, again, it's a command. Look at what is before your eyes. And the reason I think that that is probably a better translation, not that I'm a Greek scholar, but in all of the other times that Paul uses that specific verb form there, it's always in an imperative. It's always as a command. So but when the scholars were coming through here, the NIV, they thought, well, should we do this as a, as a command or just simply as an indicative, just simply stating the way things are? They chose, the NIV chose to just state it, whereas the um, ESV and some others, they made it as a command. I think a command makes sense to me because of what I just explained here. But I want us to, whether you have the NIV or the ESV or King James or New American, whatever you have, I want right now to just to understand if we see this as a command, it, Paul is saying, look. Look at what is right in front of you. Open your eyes. <laughs> it reminds me of when I was, when I was a kid. Now, this is going to be really hard for you to believe because you know, some of you guys have seen my, my ninja reflexes and my, my amazing coordination. But on a, an extreme, extremely rare Emphasis on rare occasions. When I was growing up, I could sometimes be a bit, well, clumsy. Yeah, if anyone's going to trip over anything, it would be me. Anybody who's going to fall and spill something, it would be me. And I can still hear to this day, I can remember my dad just saying, pick up your feet and watch where you're going. <laughs> well, it's kind of easy to say that, but it wasn't so easy at the time. But that's what Paul is saying. Open your eyes. Look at what is right there in front of you. 
And then what Paul does is after giving that command, then he goes, he begins to attack his attackers. Because like we said, his defense here in these final four ch chapters, it's not just passive. He is very aggressive against the lies of these people. And so he attacks his attacker, attackers and he really lists five different things that the people should notice. Five people, that he, or five things that he wants the people uh, to see. What I'm going to do is just read these verses and have you follow along. And then I'm going to point out those five things. So verses 7 through 12, if you would follow along. So look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave me, or excuse me, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So five things that Paul wants us to notice here in this passage. Let me just kind of go through those with you. First, in verse 7, Paul wanted, or excuse me, while the, while the false teachers claimed to belong to Christ, Paul wanted the people to clearly understand that he did too. He belonged to Jesus. They were claiming that he did not that he was making these things up on his own. Paul wanted them to understand very clearly. He belonged to Christ. Secondly, in verse 8, while the false teachers claimed that Paul talked too much about being an apostle, he wanted the church to understand that A, God was the one who made him an apostle, and B, his purpose was to build up the Corinthian Christians and help them grow spiritually. Now, sure, sometimes that meant that Paul had to be hard on them. Sometimes he had to call out their sin. But that was never his main purpose. It was always, always to help them become more like Christ. Thirdly, verse 9, Paul had great compassion on the Christians in Corinth. He didn't want to frighten them or to scare them into obedience. That was not his purpose. He was like a parent, a parent who disciplines their children, not, not because they want to, not because it's fun. My goodness, no one wants to be the heavy. No one wants to have to discipline their children. No parent does, but they do it. They do it out of love for their children. They do it because they care about their kids and they want to train and develop them properly. And so Paul, here too, he cares for the people. And so he spoke the truth because he cared. Fourthly, in verses 10 through 11, which is basically a repeat of what we saw last week in verse 1, Right? In spite of some of the ridiculous claims that Paul could sound really tough in his letters but was a wimp in person, Paul wants us to understand that he was, he was genuine. He was consistent. His letters were no different from the message that he would convey to them when he was in person. In spite of the fact that the false teachers were lying and saying, oh yeah, his letters, he's tough, but boy, wait till he comes. Paul's like, I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to be consistent because I care enough about you to do that. Now, granted, based on their charges, what they're saying about Paul here, maybe, maybe Paul wasn't some great physical specimen with bulging muscles. And maybe he wasn't even the most mesmerizing public speaker. We really don't know. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. Uh, their claims were that he was not. But honestly, we don't know if there's any validity to their claims or not about his skill as a public orator. We just know that Paul was an extremely intelligent man who was gifted by God and called to be an apostle, and he gave extraordinary defense in behalf of Jesus Christ. But whether Paul had some great massive build or whether Paul was some great public speaker really didn't matter. 
It really didn't. Because remember, Paul was engaged not in a physical battle. He was engaged in a spiritual battle. And so he used the truth of God's word to destroy the enemy's strongholds, to destroy their false arguments, to destroy their prideful proclamations. And Paul did that in writing, and he did that in person. Fifthly, Paul refused to play the pride game. And by the way, I'm sure you already know this, but when someone is bragging about themselves, what they are really doing is they are just showing how insecure they really are. I used to think when people were bragging all the time, it's like, wow, they think they're really great. I've realized through the years, no, what they're really saying is, I feel so insecure. I need to try to brag about myself because I need to try to convince you and myself at the same time that maybe I'm better than I really think I am. It's insecurity that brings about bragging and boasting. False teachers there in Corinth, they were always bragging about how much they supposedly knew. They were talking, always bragging about how smart that they were, how much better they were than Paul. And I'll tell you, it was all false bravado and self-conceit. And because they could not measure up to Paul, what they did then is they started, they would compare themselves to one another and to other people there in the church. Because when they did that, at least in their own eyes, they could, they could convince themselves that they looked pretty good. Let me give you an illustration of that. It, it's like me and, and basketball. I've always loved the game of basketball, and I always wanted to be a good player. In fact, I worked pretty hard on it for some years when I was in school. And the problem is I had a few minor flaws. I didn't think they were really all that important, but the, the, I was really never a very good shot. I'm too short. I can't jump. I'm too slow. And, and I'm too weak to post up for rebounds. But I'm telling you, other than those minor flaws, I'm a pretty good basketball player. And so the thing of it is, though, let's say that, that I am, I'm going to play a game of basketball against my six-year-old grandson. I can dominate him. I can. I mean... You might not mistake me for Michael Jordan or Steph Curry or anything, but yeah, I'm telling you right now, put the money on me because I'm pretty sure I will win. But let me go one-on-one -on -one against LeBron James, and yeah, I would look pretty foolish, pretty silly. And see, that's kind of what it's like for the false teachers. They compared themselves to themselves and other people so that they would look good, but compared to the Apostle Paul, they, they were foolish. They were so incompetent. So they, they could talk the talk. Oh, they could make it sound pretty good. But they weren't loving, spiritually growing Christians. They didn't care about the people. They were braggarts who just cared about themselves and their own position. And they really didn't have a clue about what it meant to live for Jesus Christ and to give themselves for others. They didn't understand it at all. Paul refused to play their childish games. He refused to boast about himself in the way that they were doing. Because remember, boasting about God and his work in our lives is the only proper reason to boast. And so Paul defended himself by speaking the truth, not by bragging about himself, not by making false reports, not by trying to build himself up that way. He didn't do it what the false teachers did. Paul spoke the truth. He understood that as an apostle, right? It was, it was a God-given position. He didn't earn it. He didn't self-proclaim it. He didn't take it upon himself. It was God who put him in the position and gave him the gifts to be an apostle. So Paul knew that. Second main point here is that Paul's ministry as an evangelist was God-given, not self-appointed. And that's in verses 13 through 18. So, I know that I am going to age myself here, but hey, when you get to be my age, you don't even care anymore. It's like, I, I, half the time, I can't even remember how old I am. I have to look at my driver's license to, just, to see. So, it's okay that I'm aging myself, and in case you're wondering, yes, I really am that old. 
But when I was in junior high and high school, there were two heavyweight boxers that they totally dominated their sport. Smokin' Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. And in fact, their first fight in March 1971, it was billed as the fight of the century. They were both undefeated. They both had 20-some wins, and both of them had won almost all of their matches by knockout. So this was billed as a really great fight. Uh, they ended up fighting three different times, and Ali won two of the times, and Frazier, of course, once there. But I, I have to just tell you, I wasn't a huge boxing fan, but I always rooted for Joe Frazier. I always did. And the reason was simple. For those of you who may remember these names, um, and I know some of you, like, yeah, who, what? But trust me, they really did live and really did fight. But Ali, he was so boastful, always so arrogant, just bragging all the time, right? And so I always, always rooted for Frazier. Now, Ali, I don't know, part of that might have been psychological warfare, trying to intimidate his opponents. I, I really don't know. But he always called himself the, the greatest boxer who ever lived. And he always said that he could not be beat. Right? He, said that, he, he said that he was Superman and that he floated like a butterfly and he stung like a bee. Right? Oh, so, so see, I'm not the only old one. So, <laughs> sorry to drag the rest of you down with me here, but I need a support there. But, in fact, I love the story about Ali when um, he was told by the stewardess on uh, the flight that he was on that was just getting ready for departure, the stewardess told him he needed to buckle his seatbelt. And Ali said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which the stewardess, oh man, I wish I had a quick wit like that. But the stewardess said, well, Superman don't need no airplane either, so sit down and buckle up. <laughs> All right? <laughs> oh, man, to have a wit like that, wouldn't that be great? But now in truth, Many people do think Ali may have indeed been the greatest fighter that ever lived. I, I'm not going to debate that. I, I don't know. But again, I'm just saying, I always hated his bragging. Just hated it. And that's just what the false teachers were like in Corinth. They were always bragging about themselves. They were always boasting. They were trying to always make themselves look better. And so Paul deals with the subject of boasting. In fact, six times in this next section, this next paragraph we're going to read here, six times he uses some form of the word boast. But as we read these verses, these six verses, I, I want you to notice that rather than being prideful, Paul was a man of humility. Paul was a man who gave all glory to God. So see, Paul knew very well that boasting about God and his work in our lives is the only proper reason to boast. So, follow along as I read these verses, and I want you to just kind of, in your mind, notice how many times he uses the word boast or some form of that. Verse 13. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves, as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. You see, Paul's mission in life was to share the gospel with everyone that he possibly could. In fact, read the book of Acts. You probably already remember this very well, but he made at least, at least three missionary journeys traveling to much of the known world at that time in order to plant churches and to disciple believers. And as he states here in verse 14, it says he was the first to come to Corinth and to plant the church there. That's what Paul loved to do, to go to places and to share the gospel message. In Romans 15, uh, verses 20 and 21, I put this on the screen so you can see it as well, but look at what he says here. He says, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, 
not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. You see, I think that that is at least part of what he is talking about there, here in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians. He says, without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Which, by the way, was exactly what the false teachers were doing. Paul is the one who had planted the church there, and they were coming, building on his work, but they were taking all of the credit for that. Uh, same passage in Romans 15 again Paul says this verse, I think it's kind of kind of interesting here he says that he had hoped to make it all the way to Spain which is perhaps part of what he means again here in verse 16 about preaching the gospel lands beyond Corinth so we understand Paul was the first one to come to Corinth with the gospel message and he planted the church there but Paul says that's not enough I want to go beyond that I want to take the gospel further even than Corinth and the point is this Paul accomplished a lot <laughs> he accomplished an awful lot I mean he wrote 13 books of the New Testament he traveled through much of the known world at that time he accomplished so much he planted many many churches and so I say to you if anyone had reason to brag about themselves or boast about their ministry it would have been Paul but the beautiful thing is he refused to engage in that. He refused to engage in the sinful, prideful practices of boasting about his own accomplishments. He refused to promote himself. And he summarized it all in verse 17, there that, that passage where he says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. It's built on, uh, based on Jeremiah chapter 9, Verses 23 and 24, what great verses. And so again, I wanted, to, I wanted to give you all of the verses there so you could see just what he is building on here. Jeremiah wrote, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his strength. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. Again, Paul understood very well that boasting about God and his work in our lives is the only proper reason to boast and what I think is really, really interesting here, now, not to get too fanatical again with the Greek and all of the various things with this, but I think that verse 17, that there says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I think this is so interesting. Something I'd never realized before, before, because when you read it in English, it can almost sound like it's just permissive, doesn't it? It's kind of like, well, if you boast, boast about God. But that's not the way it's written in Greek. It is written as an imperative. We talked earlier about an imperative. An imperative is a command. And so I think this, this is so cool. And I think it's something, I hope we can all remember this and never read that verse again quite the same way. Because we are to boast. In other words, we are commanded to boast in the Lord. To boast about the Lord. That's man that's the imperative that is given to us there so we are to boast in other words we are to glory in him in fact that's the way that the King James Version translates that we're to glory we are to glory in God and God alone it's a command boast about God when when Martin Luther the the great reformer when he died in in the year 1546 his friends found a, a scrap of paper that was stuffed in his pocket. And it was a handwritten note to himself. He wrote this letter, or this, this short note to himself, and he carried it with him, uh, assumedly so that he could always remember, or be reminded of the, the, I think, a very deep spiritual truth, a very important spiritual truth, a very simple little note that he wrote to himself. And it simply said this, we are all beggars. 
we are all beggars. We, everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we accomplish, it's all because of the amazing grace of God. It's not how big or smart or powerful or rich or any of that. It's nothing. It is all because of the amazing grace of God. We have nothing to boast about in and of ourselves. Because you see, spiritually speaking, we are all just beggars. And so, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That is our command to obey. Or to put it another way, <laughs> boasting about God and his work in our lives is the only proper reason to boast. So let's boast. We are commanded to boast about God, to bring glory to him. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you for the truth that you are such a great God. We sang about that earlier, but God, the reality is that you are God like there is no one else. You are infinite. You are almighty. You are all powerful. And yet you are God of love and grace and mercy. And so, Father, we kneel before you in awe of you. We want to honor you. We want to obey you. But God, we also want to proclaim you. Not just what you have done in our lives, but we just want to proclaim your greatness. And so would you help us this week? God, everyone who is here right now, give us an opportunity sometime this week that we can boast about you to someone. And God, let us stand up and stand tall in doing it properly, boasting about you Help us not forget that that is not just given as a permissive okay if we want to boast. It is a command to us that we are to boast in you. Oh, be glorified through our words and our actions this week as we do indeed boast about you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.